And on the wrap tonight, Arkansas follows Indiana and drafts their own religious freedom law. But Republican Governor Asa Hutchinson is pushing back. And is it time to stop negotiating with Iran? One prominent Democrat says yes. Hillary Clinton's poll numbers are taking some big drops in key presidential states, battleground ones. Will this make the former first lady rethink running for president? Okay, so it is April Fool's Day. We'll discuss all of that and more in riveting fashion. This is The Daily Wrap. And welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Joe Concha with the man who's the real-life version of the most interesting man in the world That's from the Dos Equis commercial. You know, you finally that said something that was true. That is true. True, yes. Finally, finally. Yes, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you, Rick Unger. I don't often drink beer, but oh, go ahead. <laughs> when you do, <laughs> enjoy Dos Equis. And we're also joined by Heather Hansen and Lisa Jandovitz. They're actually the real-life inspiration for Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> Absolutely, we are. The no, question no, is, who is who's Laverne who's and who's Shirley? Shirley? I have to have the L, so. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I have to be Shirley. Oh, Lisa's boy, Laverne makes Sense. Enough. Let's go to the daily download. <laughs> well, this week we've seen some major backlash over Indiana's religious freedom bill to the point that Governor Mike Pence has decided additional language was needed in order to prove to pretty much the whole country that Indiana does not discriminate based on sexual orientation. Well, today, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, obviously seeing the reaction that Pence had to deal with, made this announcement about his state's religious freedom bill. The bill that is on uh, my desk at the present time does not precisely mirror the federal law. Therefore, I ask that changes be made in the legislation. And I've asked that the leaders of the General Assembly to recall the bill so that it can be amended to reflect the terms of the Federal uh, Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. So Hutchinson taking a cue from Pence saying he has a responsibility to protect religious freedom but also fight against discrimination. Yep, it's tightrope time. My responsibility is to speak out on my own convictions and to do what I can as governor to make sure this bill reflects the values of the people of Arkansas, protects those of religious conscience, but also minimizes the chance of discrimination uh, in the workplace and in uh, the public environment. So Lisa, you're heavily involved with the Catholic Church and even close encounter with uh, Monsignor uh, Jim Lasante. Is, what's the reaction you think going to be from social conservatives, religious conservatives, when they see governors capitulate this quickly? Well, there's ob obviously going to be some of, of an outcry because they're, uh, particularly evangelicals, are going to say that this is they're not they're being discriminated against and now and not able to uh, consciously ad object according to their beliefs, according to their uh, their faith. And that's what makes this like a really uh, tricky situation because, again, and we, we saw Governor Hutchinson say this, uh, no one wants to discriminate against uh, gays and lesbians or because of sexual orientation, and yet there is there would be discrimination against people's own personal beliefs if they were being punished. As, as uh, Senator Rubio said, should these people be punished if they are saying that they don't want to, uh, whether it's a florist or a, a baker, actually be part of a gay cer ceremony and providing services, should there be punishment? You know, when we kind of saw something like this with the Catholic Church and with the whole uh, health and human services mandate with, with uh, birth control, should they be forced, Catholic or organizations, and it was found out that they should not be, to, to provide birth control uh, when it goes against the religious beliefs? Heather? It may be that the courts will ultimately decide some of these. In other states, actions have been taken against florists and so forth, and it's now moving up the, the channels in the courts. But, you know, this is a difficult issue for everybody. There was a mm -hmm. poll in February where they asked whether wedding-related services should be forced to provide services against their religious convictions to same-sex marriages. 57% mm -hmm. said no. Oh, okay. Of, and so, that's an AP yeah. poll. Mm -hmm. So 57% said, said no. In 2014, there was a Gallup poll 
asking about same-sex marriage, 55% said that they felt gay marriage should be valid. So they are different issues. Mm -hmm. And it's not just politicians who are confused and wondering where they stand. I think Americans, according to those polls, are confused and wondering where they stand. And it's something that we all have to work out together. And I think it has to be in a case-by-case -case basis and not as a rule, this is the rule. But how strong is your conviction? How well-founded is it? How discriminatory is your action? And mm -hmm, do it case right. by case. Rick, Heather just said there's a difficult issue for everyone. Yeah. I think it's a difficult issue for Republicans because they don't seem to have a cohesive message on how they're going to handle this. They're getting beat up in the media, clearly. Washington Post front page today says, this drags Republicans into a culture war they don't want to necessarily right. fight because they, they lose on those issues with millennials that's and so right. on. So well, that's just it. I mean, the politics of it and the reality of it are two very different things. What both of these ladies have said is absolutely correct. It is anybody who's really thinking this through understands there's two very solid sides mm -hmm. to this argument. But for politicians, it's a different test. And you're right, when you consider what the millennials are, are going to believe about this, and even beyond that, because you're seeing even people my age having this difficulty, because it's a very, very difficult situation. You don't want discrimination. The question now, though, is going to be how is this solved? And there's two ways. Indiana can remove Section 7 that takes it beyond just the government and brings it down to the private industry situation. They probably did the same in Arkansas. They can take that out or they can add protection for members of the, of the LGBT and uh, transgender sex. Well, let's talk more about the political aspect of this. Hillary Clinton certainly capitalizing on these bills. Uh, the former first lady and secretary of state and senator took to Twitter saying, sad this new Indiana law can happen in America today. We shouldn't discriminate against people because of who they love. Hashtag LGBT. And quote, like in law, Arkansas bill goes beyond protecting religion, would permit unfair discrimination against LGBT Americans. I urge governor to veto End quote. So it looks like the left are in the driver's seat here. Pollster John Zogby told Newsmax today the GOP does not make inroads with millennials, as I just mentioned, particularly on the subject of LGBT rights. The party is, and I quote, cruising for a bruising in 2016, according to Mr. Zogby. By the way, you know how you don't connect with millennials? By using sayings from the 50s like <laughs> cruising for a bruising, correct a mundo. <laughs> The Vernon Shirley might say it, but yeah. that's about the extent not of the it. millennials. Yeah. yeah. So well, yeah, Hillary's got it easy on this issue. Oh, no doubt. Yes. Oh, it's yes. not she hard for her to take that issue. position. But the timing She's very talkative right. all of a sudden. It's remarkable. Yeah. It gives yeah. Republicans Quickly. time to get it together, though. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We're, we're 22 months from an election, yeah. and for the Republicans that sat out and didn't comment but at all, John Kasich, yeah. good job. Anyways, a time to walk away from a deal with Iran. This is The Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax. And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. Well, sometimes the media writes some pretty silly stuff, don't I know? A couple of hours ago, Reuters reported on a potential Iran deal, writing, and we quote, major powers in Iran were closer to a preliminary accord on Tehran's nuclear program as marathon talks ran into Wednesday, but were stuck over key details such as lifting UN sanctions and Iran's future atomic research. <laughs> oh, so basically the only thing keeping a deal from happening was the like deal. all the important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Reuters I have respect for them, and they're right. We're no closer to a deal that will live in Iran's nuclear program while easing economic sanctions. Secretary of State John Kerry has agreed to one more day of negotiating with Iran, but should he have? This morning on MSNBC, former Democratic Governor Howard Dean shocked many when he said this. I think Obama, Obama is right to try to get a deal. I'm worried about the way these negotiations have gone, and I, I think that Joe is right, probably a step away from the table and say, okay, you know, you're not backing off on sending you the uranium to Russia, and you're not, uh, and, and we'll get rid of the sanctions at our own pace. So Mr. Dean thinks we should walk away. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest, who makes a daily appearance on this show, today was asked if Secretary of State John Kerry was also prepared to walk away. I think our approach to these conversations hasn't changed, which is that as long as we are in a position of convening serious talks that are making progress, that we would not arbitrarily or abruptly end them. But if we are in a situation where we sense that the talks have stalled, then yes, the United States uh, and the international community uh, is prepared to walk away. 
And as you may imagine, Israel continues to be concerned with a pending deal. Today, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, while meeting with Speaker of the House John Boehner, responded to a prominent Iranian militant member who isn't even a part of the government after he said, quote, the destruction of Israel is non-negotiable, unquote. Well Iran must stop its aggression in the region, stop its terrorism throughout the world, and stop its threats to annihilate Israel. That should be non-negotiable. And that's the deal that the world powers must insist upon. Okay, so should we walk away? Are world powers on the verge of selling out Israel and stability in the Middle East? Let's bring back to the wrap former senior analyst for the Department of Defense and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Matt McGinnis joins us. Matt, what's your take on all this? Well, I'm actually happy to hear that we're bringing back talk of walking away. I mean, this is something that has been missing for a while. Uh, you know, because I, I think the, we underestimate how much the Iranians want to deal, and we overestimate, uh, you know, how much that we're we're entrapped and committed in these talks, and it's just we, we can't imagine walking away. I think that there needs to be some sober reality uh, that you know, if we're not getting a deal that we, we like, that's going to give us confidence that Iran's not going to pursue a nuclear weapon, we need to be willing to kind of uh, just stand up and and and, and take a break. Matt, it's Heather Hansen. I think one of the things that we often forget, at least I did, is that you talked about how much they, the Iranians want to deal. They're getting $700 million a month now that the sanctions have been lifted since 2013. Isn't their big driving factor here and any desperation that they have in the fact that we have sanctions that we can put back down so that they stop getting this money back? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think it's not just the, the, the money that's coming in right now. It's about the, the amount of, you know, enormous amounts of money that could come in after a deal. Uh, you know, Iran is it's not just about the sanctions that are hurting them right now. It's also about the low oil prices, but it's also the, these very severe economic structural problems that Iran is facing. Uh, and, and President Rouhani recognizes, and I think the Supreme Leader does as well, that they've got to have some relief if they're going to be able to have anything significant uh, develop on, on their, their economic front the next, for the next five to ten years. So that we, again, we really need to you know, remember our leverage here. Hey, Matt, it's Rick Unger. You know, the past few days, what we've really been hearing more about is this notion of a preliminary deal with everything continuing for another three months. Won't it be a little bit embarrassing if even if we keep going another day or two and they announce a deal and it's just a preliminary deal that doesn't hit the big notes? That's not going to be good for anybody, is it? No, and I think we're, we're in this interesting period where the real deadline is when Congress comes back from the Easter recess, you know, April 13th, uh, you know, when, when Senators Corker, uh, Kirk, and others are going to be looking at potential sanctions legislation or other legislation that will affect the, uh, potentially affect the Iranian deal. So I think that's actually what's driving the U.S. is that they want to bring something to Congress, and that's why they're willing to talk for days on end past 31 uh, March. The real issue is that the Iranians know that the deadline is June 30th. Uh, that's what they're working with. Uh, so they're continuing to kind of, you know, grandstand, you know, take us to the brink as much as they can to get a better deal. Hey, Matt, it's Joe Concha again. You know, I see this in sports all the time, whenever there's a strike or a work stoppage. And there's a deadline, and then there's the real deadline, just like you talked about. Are you surprised that we even revealed that there was a March 31st deadline when we sure as hell knew that it never was going to happen? Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised when we did this originally because knowing, knowing the Iranians, they're, they're going to want to pick through all the details at the end. And certainly the Supreme Leader has said this many times that, you know, he doesn't like the idea of a two-phase deal. And, and I, I kind of wondered as soon as, you know, you know, the Ayatollah was coming out, you know, complaining about this, I, I just knew that we were going to end up just having to focus on a June deadline. And so this was, this was a complication that the administration, because they're not working well with Congress, kind of put themselves in a bind uh, in, until Congress is feeling more comfortable where the administration is going on the negotiations. Matt, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate your input. And uh, I would imagine we may be speaking to you again very soon to talk about the real, real deadline, which, as you said, <laughs> happens when Congress comes back. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, panel, lightning round time. Lisa, what are the chances of us not getting a deal tomorrow, because it ain't happening, but a deal ever? I'm not sure, but again, listening to to, uh, to this uh, and listening to what Matt had to, to, had to say, you it makes us wonder what the framework actually means. What this March 30th deadline or March 31st or April 1st deadline, what can be accomplished by that? 
and when they're clearly looking, Iran is clearly looking at the June deadline. Um, better to have a deal, obviously, than no deal, but there's so many points that, that are not being addressed right now. Heather, is it better to have a bad deal than no deal? No. Okay. No, no deal is definitely, um, I, I think we're headed towards no deal. The fact that Russia, China, and France have gone home and left their aides behind certainly lends itself to what are we doing? And what, what are we going to be the only one left right. at the table? Please, please come back. Who's it's, the superpower in it's the room, right, right? Exactly. It really is. And it's, it's, just, it's not just embarrassing. It's, it is damaging to our relationship with our allies who are not, not just Israel, but Saudi Arabia as well, who are really concerned. It's, it's, it's starting to look like John Kerry has de developed an affinity towards Swiss chocolates and just <laughs> doesn't want to leave yeah. the country. Look, you know, I'm kind of with the boys this morning. You know, as somebody who's negotiated a lot of deals, mm -hmm. you got to walk at some point. Yeah. And on that note, coming up next, Hillary is taking a hit in the polls. Could her presidential aspirations be disappearing? <laughs> this is The Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax. Yeah, welcome back to the show. Well, a new Quinnipiac poll out yesterday shows that Hillary Clinton is taking a hit in the polls in three key swing states, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Out of the 1,000 voters surveyed, the former Secretary of State's favorability rating is 49% in Florida, 48% Pennsylvania, 51% in the great state of Ohio. When compared to top GOP contenders, Mrs. Clinton's lead is close, but not by much in two key swing states, as you can see. Mr. Bush, Jeb, is beating Hillary Clinton in his home state, where he was once governor, 45 to 42 percent, and Rand Paul beating Hillary in Pennsylvania, 45 to 44. Some interesting numbers there, no question about it. Uh, by the way, the Ohio poll, can we show Ohio? Do we have that uh, on screen, everybody? Clinton leads all Republicans by at least a five-point margin there. Uh, then again, John Kasich wasn't uh, included in that poll. But uh, here's another interesting question asked in the same poll. Is Hillary trustworthy? Uh, Florida, mm, uh, the, the villages, they're not thinking uh, that's happening at all. That's nearly, that's half, 9% margin. Uh, Pennsylvania, same thing, 5% margin. Ohio, it's basically split. Uh, I'd love to meet those 46% of those people who think she actually is trustworthy. I mean, we got to hey, go bowling hey, sometime. Hey, 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 hey. Anyway, I shouldn't editorialize. I'm the host. Anyway, obviously, the email scandal has affected voters' opinions somewhat. But what does all this mean for 2016? Trust is not a four-letter word. It's very important. So, everybody, these poll numbers mean anything to you? I don't Lisa? think it means anything in terms of her presidential hopes. I think, and again, we're uh, more than a year away from the general election. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, it, what it shows is that people are paying attention to what's been happening in terms of the email and uh, the foreign donations to the Clinton Foundation, and which is why you're seeing people saying that they don't trust her. But will that have an effect? No, because really, who else is out there in, uh, in terms you know, of the Democrats? Interesting with, with Bill Clinton's presidency towards the end. Obviously, he had a big trust problem as well. Definition of is is he obviously lied. He was impeached, and his poll numbers by the time he left were nearly seventy percent. Right. So yeah. I wonder if trust really is as important as we're giving it credit for. I think arrogance. Somebody who used to work for Romney was quoted today in one of the papers as saying, "Arrogance and hypocrisy are what voters cannot stand." Mm. And I think that the way that she has handled the questions about these issues has been arrogant. Mm -hmm. And it has, and, and the, the way that she handled the emails is hypocritical. So I think that those issues together, you know, one of the emails that has been outed and many, many more are coming, has her talking about a drone attack in Pakistan. And then she's asking Huma Aberdeen, her mm -hmm. assistant, about decorating her home. And I think that when people start seeing these emails... Whoa, whoa, whoa. But, but before you go on, was it to make the home drone-proof? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we need no, to consider no. this. So yeah. clearly there's mingling of personal and, and professional, which mm. is one of the things that she said didn't happen. Right. And then there's also this sense that she's, you know, thinking about decorating when she's talking about drone attacks. I think that when we start seeing more and more of these emails, you know, we've always had this discussion, and Rick has said it makes no difference, and you've said enough sh shavings make a pile. Mm. If each email can consist of a shaving, you're going to have a big pile of hypocrisy. But those right. emails, didn't she decide what we were seeing anyway? It, but even with that, Joe, I mean, she decided on these, and we've only seen four, and mm -hmm. of the four, two of them have things that if I were on the other side, you could spin it. I have in my inbox, and I've had my Yahoo account since I was 2001, I know of seven emails that no one's ever going to see, yeah. ever, including you. You better wipe that <laughs> Particularly you. You better guys, wipe that Guys, guys, anyway. guys, big picture here. Think about this. This woman has been at the center 
of a nonstop media bashing. We've talked about this every night for how many weeks? That's not true. There was a, two weeks ago on a Wednesday we didn't we talk skipped about it. it. Okay. Why is she and being she, bashed? Wait a minute. And I'm, that's not my point. My point is, is that she's still sitting there at fifty percent. No how many politicians, else? guys? It's not just in her own party. They're not asking, you know, who would you vote for as the Democratic nominee? They're putting her up against these other candidates. She is still hanging at around 50%. I promise you, the Republicans are looking at those polls and going, oi vey. They figured she'd take more of a hit. Of course. Right. I figured she'd take a bigger hit. Mm -hmm. I, I, think she's, I, I think she's been in the public eye for 23 right. years, right, mm -hmm. since 1992, let's call it. So you have an opinion of her. It's so hard to change. Oh, I didn't know that she can't be trustworthy with those emails. You either liked her or you hated her. You know what's going to be interesting, and it's been reported twice today, once on page six, that Monica Lewinsky may be the new co-host of The View. <laughs> now, if that is the case, oh. if that is the case, it could have a f an effect for the millennials about how they feel and about that's Hillary. that's why it's not going to happen. Well, that's what I was thinking, oh. too. But that it would be just too um, politically not gonna right. Happen. Uh, but wouldn't what, that Monica's be interesting? not going to happen on The View? No. Because the politics are you, you such think, that... that and I'll tell you what, if it does happen, I never want to hear anybody ever again accuse ABC of le being a liberal... That's right. You know, right... right. right. But you're the one who, when you said it, well, it's not going to happen. Yeah. wandered in my jurisdiction, <laughs> and you're both completely and totally wrong. All but right? It is going to happen? What, no, I'm, I'm saying saying that, no, the motivation, right? Ideology will go out the window oh, as far understand. as ABC. The it is business. Is something else. That show is and on. And they will I get, get ratings. If Monica Lewinsky oh, no. is but on, I mean, that will... you certainly can't say that they're a liberal mouthpiece if they put Monica Lewinsky on a year before the election. You got me in the middle of my defibrillator analogy, all right? <laughs> It needs Monica, it, it, because the producers there are so stupid, they think that people are going to tune in like she has a coherent thought in her head. Right. right? I think she does. I'm sure, well, every day? She's never done TV in her life. <laughs> Ridiculous. Anyway, Potluck is next. This is The Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax TV. And welcome back to Daily Wrap. It's potluck time. This is the part of the show. We go around the table, share our favorite stories of the day. I'm going first today. You know why? Because it's my show. Because you want to. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Alphabetical, actually. C, concha. concha. There you go. Yes. Are. And that's that. So anyway, <laughs> is it time, Rick Unger and Ooh. Heather and Lisa, for the Electoral College to go? And here's why I ask this question. We always hear that America decides in November of 2016 will be the next president, right? America doesn't decide anymore. Who decides? Very easy. The people of Florida, the people of Virginia, the people of Ohio, and then your random state you want to throw in, New Hampshire, Iowa, Colorado. There's always that fourth state that's a variable. But basically those three states will decide who the next president is. The last election, 2012, Mitt Romney didn't lose by a couple million votes or four or five percentage points. He lost by 330,000 votes across four states, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Those four. If those four went in his direction, the fourth was New Hampshire, then he's the president of the United States despite losing the popular vote. So I, I wanted to ask this today, of particularly you two, because you're, you're lawyers, and Lisa, obviously, your opinion means everything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Why does the Electoral College exist when clearly now it has outworn its welcome when it's going to come down to those forces? Well, I can tell you why it exists. The why it exists is because when this country was founded, there was considerable worry that small states would be ignored yep. mm -hmm. if, uh, if there wasn't the Electoral College. And by the way, there's some truth to it. If you're a, a television station mm -hmm. in New Hampshire, you're not happy with the idea of the Electoral College going away because right. no one's going to buy advertising there anymore. Right. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh no, that's very real. So you mentioned small so, states being ignored, right? That's now, the you know what the irony is now? That they control it. No, 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 no. What? That the biggest states get ignored. Right. California, no, no, that's true. New York, New York Texas. Right. The three because, biggest states. Because they're already gone. They will not right. set foot in those states. They're already they gone. That's to. very true. Right. So, so, but also keep this in mind. And I understand why people want to do away with it, but there's only been one election in our lifetime where the Electoral College me. result. Let me guess. Where the Electoral College result than, than the, the popular vote? vote? Yeah. Uh, that was obviously 2000. Gore Bush. I have no idea. It was Gore Bush. Yeah. Look at that. That's we did not <laughs> practice that, I swear. <laughs> without I mean, that without Florida, you know, it's Florida, my 20s right. Florida were right. the votes yeah. that made the difference. Right. Yeah, Al right. Gore had already won. 
Yeah. The popular. Okay, I want Heather's uh, thoughts real quick because I don't want to step on the next potluck. Well, I just think that it, if you did the popular vote, California would get all the attention. There's never a fair way, and so the idea was to make sure that poor little Rhode Island wasn't wasn't lo overlooked in this whole process. There's no there's no perfect way. It, you could start splitting the states up into districts. And there's different ways to maybe fix it, but it's never going to be perfect. So keep it because why bother? Well, and it's and it's history. It's it's and it would be difficult to change it's under part the law. Of the fabric of America, of our country. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. our three straight. But country. individual votes would matter more in terms of if it's, if the popular yeah. vote were. The, the truth as, is, as there's as no point in voting if you live in New York. Right. If you live in New York and yeah. you already know a st the state has gone yeah. in one direction, it's like does how I much does my love, vote matter? I would love to see the campaign because they'd have to go to North Dakota and they'd have yeah, to go to all these states, yeah, right? And all these campaign gurus would be kicked out. That's right. <laughs> right? Because right. there is no strategy anymore. Just get the most votes. Yeah. Anyway, our next potluck is up, and it's Heather Hansen. We have a major problem in prisons right now where there's been a real issue of radicalization of inmates, Muslim radicalization, Islam radicalization of inmates. And in 2003, the Senate Subcommittee on Terrorism talked about the problem of vetting the chaplains who were being oftentimes paid, sometimes volunteers, but oftentimes paid to come in and provide religion services to the inmates being the vehicle of radicalization. And they talked about it in 2003, and they talked about how are we going to vet these people to mm -hmm. ensure that the people who are coming in are not radicalizing the inmates. Nothing was done. In 2011, in front of the Department of Homeland Security, there was another whole big thing about this. We need to better vet the people who are coming in. Nothing was done. Now, in the meantime, there have been a number, and there's an article today. I, I saw this as an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today. And they go through various people who have left prisons and ended up committing crimes or trying to plan terrorist, terrorist attacks after having been radicalized in jail. And my question is, why have not we vetted these people, found a way to better vet the people who are going in and to keep the radical literature out of the prisons? You know, we talk about religious freedom in, the, in our first part of this case, this day, our, our show tonight, and yet we're not controlling religious freedom. And instead, we're allowing these people to go into prisons, talk to these people, and the results are deadly. Right. We know it's a hotbed for radicalization. Why isn't something, as you said, why isn't something being done? How are these people allowed to come in without anything known on their background or what they are intending to do? And then, and then looking at the prisoners themselves and what is, what, what is happening. Well, and they're being chosen by apparently different Islamic groups that are, that are perhaps questionable, according to this article. So I don't know the answer, but I do know that there has to be a better way. There's got to be vetting of these people. They're being paid to go in and preach to the prisoners, and what they're preaching is terrorism mm -hmm. <laughs> in, many of, in many instances. So it's a real problem. Wow. Heather, that was tremendous. Um, that is a problem. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you just, you right. said religious freedom, if that's what the yeah. prisoners want to hear. Right, right. Well, the, this this yeah. Wall Street Journal article is well worth reading. Yep. Mm -hmm. and there was religious freedom, and it is still at Gitmo. That's the irony, yeah. right? They practice whatever they want. Anyway, we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, more potluck for you, including Rick's. Mm -hmm. It says impromptu using my own, but for once I went first. So, right. Daily Wrap, Newsmax, we're back in a moment. <laughs> And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. I'm your host, Joe Conchin. If you're just joining us, we're in the middle of our potluck, where we're sharing our favorite stories of the day. LJ, you are up next. What are you serving up? Well, there's a new study that raises concerns about kids having, and I mean children, not, not necessarily teens, having sips of wine or beer, and uh, primarily given to them by parents. And what this study says, it is by the uh, Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs, that children who had a, sipped alcohol by the sixth grade were five times more likely to have a full drink by the time they were in high school, and four times more likely to binge drink or get drunk. Mm. And sometimes parents think, uh, you know, oh, what is a sip of, of uh, you know, try this, they're at a party, and, and we're, in, we're in our home, and I'm giving it to you. But what this study has found, uh, one of the theories is that when it's offered by a parent, it kind of send, it sends the message that drinking is okay. okay. And we're talking about in this country, because we, we talked about this a little bit before, we're not talking about kids in, in France or in Italy where it's wine and it's part of dinner. We're talking about parents that, you know, and there are parents that think it's okay for kids to have this. If it's in their home and they're giving it to them, it's okay. And this study is saying that there's concern for that, for giving a child even sips of alcohol. I'm trying to get my head around a parent doing that with a fifth grader. I, I get the whole bonding uh, with your are, son thing yeah. at a Yankee game when he's 15 and maybe we'll share a beer sick. kind of yeah. thing, right? 
when they're in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are you thinking? Now, I'm not saying every parent is an alcoholic that does that. Are they trying to, because beer tastes horrible when you're a kid. Is, is that the approach? Like, let's give them a couple sips and they'll come to hate it? I think sometimes it's parents think that. Approach. I think sometimes yeah. parents think, oh, the, you know, it's not a big deal. Or, uh, and we talked about this before, yeah. even for older kids. I think a lot of parents want to be their kids' friends and yeah. pals and think it's, it's but fifth okay. Grade, that's, but fifth yeah. grade, yeah. that's not being your friend's pal. High school, no. you're trying to be your friend's pal, which is also a bad idea. But at fifth grade, I think you're just asking for no, trouble. Now, Heather, you, you binge drink now. Um, did, <laughs> what <laughs> what <laughs> led to this behavior exactly? Uh, I, I actually was third grade. Was, 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 oh, right. my, yeah, uh, my mother would die because I was not allowed to touch anything ever. But I do think what happens sort of is there's this idea that if I offer them a sip, it won't be so sexy. It won't be such an unknown. They'll have tasted it. It won't mm -hmm. be so attractive because, you know, it's always the thing that's hidden behind the door. It turns out they like it. It turns, it turns, out, yeah, it turns out, out that they the like it or that they think to this, that or that I think that they think, according to this study, that by the parent giving it to them, there's something okay, okay. about that yeah. because my parent wouldn't offer me right. something that's going to cause me harm. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that that study will probably, there will probably be some follow-up to that to figure out, you know, what is the best way? Because now you know what not to do, but do you allow your teenagers at what age? And, you know, parenting, I'm not a parent, but it's hard. Sure. I don't have to worry about this for, you know, at least <laughs> yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Still watch another couple of years. Yeah, I think the key is uh, that the beer you're serving is really what's important here. So if you serve Keystone, for instance, they will hate it. They will never have it. You give them Rolling Rock, they're going to have a problem. Right. Natural Light. That's it. Right. Olympia. Right. All those. Yeah. They will never drink a sip of beer again. But if they're giving them the good stuff, the champagne of beers like Budweiser and Michelob. Then that's what turns them. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to dig deeper into that study to see exactly what's being served to these children. Rick, what are you serving up? Oh, my goodness. Once upon a time, about four days ago. <laughs> we all thought that everything was settled in the United States Senate with the Democrats. Harry Reid had announced his retirement. Chuck Schumer was going to be the new big kahuna of the Democratic Party in the Senate. And we thought, and Dick Durbin thought, that there had been a little bit of a deal made. Durbin, who's actually first in line to follow Reid, had agreed that he would step aside and let Chuck Schumer jump over him and take the leadership. But in return, Chuck Schumer would endorse Durbin to keep his current job as the number two, which is the, the whip. Well, Schumer doesn't see it quite that way. It turns out Schumer's now saying, I never made that deal. That's not what we shook on. And now Schumer's making noise that he might want to support Patty Murray, the senator from Washington state. So you know that peace, love, all that stuff the Democrats were playing as they were getting ready for next year when Harry Reid goes away? Not so fast is Chuck Schumer. My question, is Chuck Schumer already showing himself to be a guy you can't trust? Well, it, it begs the question, is there some personal animosity between the well, two of them? Well, it's very interesting. The two of them used to be very close friends. They were roommates oh, in wow. Washington for years. And the stress between roommates them... they couldn't afford their own apartment? No, most, <laughs> most, do that. most no, senators can't. Do They're that. usually yeah. three or four to an apartment. Can yeah. two Democratic yeah. bachelors well, share an apartment <laughs> 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 without driving each other crazy? There's a TV like a show. There's, yeah. there's the political <laughs> animosity, whatever it is, on uh, on Amazon. But, but they were very close. And then when this started to get close, a couple of years oh, really? back, and they were becoming competitive for leadership. Oh, they kind of ruptured. Who do you believe? Um, they're politicians. Do I don't believe either of them. I don't, believe, anybody. Anybody. I don't yeah. believe either of them. They're politicians. If wow. they can't work together, then it's not for anybody's good to well, have them there together. Well, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. If they have this bad relationship, I right. think that's the point. Right. Does Chuck Schumer really want his number two guy? Not yeah, being somebody, somebody that, yeah. wouldn't it be great if they destroyed each other and then Patty Murray. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Boom. She anyway. thinks it would be great. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for our potluck. But when we come back, it's yay or nay. This is the Daily Wrap, and it's only on Newsmax TV. And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. It's time for yay or nay. First up, President Obama ending March with a bang by reducing the sentences of 22 drug offenders. USA Today reporting this was, quote, the most 
Community, uh, now, how do you pronounce that word? Commutations. Commutations issued by a president in a single day since President Clinton issued 150 pardons and 40 commutations on his last day in office. The president says the people on the list were mostly nonviolent offenders who were maybe the girlfriend of the guy who actually committed the crime and got caught up in the whole mess but have otherwise led exemplary lives. Good idea for this many, yay or nay, misgenders. I'm going to say if they're, again, they said they're nonviolent offenders, these are not drug dealers, otherwise, you know, all of the things that are that are listed, I would say yay, then, to give them a chance. You know what I'm curious of? How do you pick the 22? Because there's probably thousands of nonviolent right, right. drug offenders. I can actually tell you how. Oh, good. Okay. There, every, there's much more than 22, obviously, that applied. Uh, they're very carefully vetted, and the recommendation is made to the president. And uh, there were, I don't know how many were recommended, but I assure you that most of them were thrown out. Yeah, I mean, oh, this okay. is inevitable. You know, everybody, Jeb Bush, Rand Paul, Ted yeah. Cruz, Rick Perry, they have all teamed up with Democratic constituents to pass similar legislation. Everybody is looking for criminal reform. We've got to clean this up. I think everybody, the Koch brothers have put in tons of money into this. Hmm. So I'm definitely a yay. It's something's got to give in our system. We're all yays. Okay, very good. So the world's oldest person passed away today at 117 years old. The Guinness World Record holder passing away peacefully with her grandson by her side, who was probably like 75 when you do the math, right? Mm. Uh, to give you some perspective, she was born in 1898. Some call that the 19th century. So, panel, would you want to live past 100? Rick Unger, that's 54 <laughs> years away for you. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not really. It's less, I think. Um, you know, it depends on, on, on my brain. If my brain is functioning reasonably close to where it is today, which puts me at a deficit to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, why not? As long as I don't feel too bad and I, I can still reason and communicate. Okay, Heather, you that's 71 like that years lady? away for you. I don't care what I look like. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, think, I think I feel the same way, but I think the other thing that's hard about that is you lose your family, you lose your friends. You mm -hmm. know, if you're the only, if everybody's living that long, then sure, we can all be old and happy. And, right, Lisa you know. Green Mile, right? Wow. Tom Hanks outlives everybody. That was his curse. Right. And then right. he was lonely because he right. didn't know anybody anymore, right? right? right. So. I mean, Rick mentioned the brain, and but also there's the physicality of it. Are you in a wheelchair? Are you bedridden? Are you unable to do anything? Mm -hmm. And then that makes it kind of tough. I don't know. Okay. I am a nay 99. Shut it off. Do not resuscitate. <laughs> Call Kevorkian. Well, Until it's like his anymore. grandson, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> Finally tonight, do you remember Blake Griffin's epic performance, we all do, at the 2011 NBA Slam Dunk Contest? There he is. Did not get Yep, he cleared a frigging car yeah. and still had enough airtime to dunk a basketball. Well, yeah. fast forward four years later, when Lloyd Hickinson tried to recreate the magic at a dunk contest in Mexico, and let's just say no bueno. Professional basketball player Lloyd Hickinson attempted a slam dunk over a convertible. Yep, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Hickinson brushed himself off and tried the stunt again, which he nailed one-handed, by the way. So, yay or nay, should you win a car? Win the car if you could slam dunk over it, Lisa. You've done this before. Yes, and if you can, like I can, <laughs> you should win a car. I could just say nay to that. <laughs> you must have so many cars at home. Yeah, well. Yeah, I agree. If you have that kind of skill, and uh, right. um, then I think that you, sh sure, you can have a car. Why right. do you keep watching this guy destroy uh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's not comfortable. Whoa, it's uh, like on a loop. Um, my answer is this is today's I really don't care. Okay. You always have oh, one, yeah. so it may yeah. as well be this. Yeah. Well, yeah. apathy rules the day. Can we show Griffin's dunk again? <laughs> yeah, because I want to point better. out something very important. Let's cue up Griffin. The good one. The good, yeah, well, it's the only yeah. one, right? So Now, oh, you see how he went over? He went over the hood. Yeah. 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 That is the trick. Right. That is a lower part of the car. Now, well, guys, the show other, show the guy from Mexico again. It was a convertible. It was a convertible. Mexico. So he but look he was, where yeah. he goes. He goes over, he tries to go over that part. Uh, if he went over, over the, the hood, hood he clears it. Oh, but here's well, the thing. He it was set up wrong. There's, he obviously practiced. They obviously practiced. Not enough. 
And well, no, but he did it the next time. So you know he must have practiced. And so he must have thought he was going to outdo Griffin by going over a little bit higher and getting a convertible in there. And then the first time, it just didn't do it. But yeah. now forever, that image yes. is. I know. There we go. That's a yeah, perfect right view. Over See, the right over the hood. Just, did you do it? And then he's yeah. smart. <laughs> then he hangs on it. And then he eventually falls back onto the car again. So uh -huh. I think uh, this is kind of like what we talked about with uh, movies and, and reality shows. They're running out of ideas. So after Griffin did this, now, how do you... Yeah, in, instead instead of, of winning the car, maybe you should win the basketball hoop. You could use one. I could use one. They're very yeah. expensive. Very we were good. talking about that. Anyway, panel, great job tonight. We really appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow night, everybody. I'm Joe Concha for The Daily Wrap saying you stay classy, San Diego. Mm.